months ago for, for a series of sermons. And we're going to begin this morning to discuss some of life's toughest questions. I've come up with four or five questions that I think are some that are, are some of the toughest in our life. Our studies will come from the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you'll turn there to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, that's where we're going to be. Ecclesiastes uh, is written by the world's wisest and also the world's richest man. His name was Solomon, who also happened to be the king of Israel, who also happened to be the son of the great king David. If there was ever uh, a wisdom literature, a literature that was written you know, in a wisdom form that applies as much today as it did in the day it was written, I believe it's the book of Ecclesiastes. I believe we can look at the, the writings and the truths here and we see exactly what's happening today. So today as we begin our questions, and I called it life's toughest questions. As we begin our question, I want us to look at a question that I think is probably foundational to every other question. I think it's a question that, that all of our life, that everything we do, everything we think, comes to play under the foundation of this particular question. Everything we deal with, I think, comes from this question. The question is this, what is the point? Of my life. Probably another way to say that is, does my life really matter? Have you ever noticed how many folks in our age, in our day and time, are seeking to find content? I mean, they're, they're, they're looking for content everywhere, and they're not finding it. They're, they're not content in this life because they're just looking elsewhere. The other day, I was going into our local Walmart. And as I'm going in, I, I saw this lady coming through the parking lot, and she looked like she was kind of just struggling with life, or you know, kind of looked a little down. So I thought, well, I'm going to be an encourager. I'm going to be nice to her. And as, uh, so I come up beside her, and I say, like, isn't it such a pretty day? And she says, I don't like this change in the weather. It affects my sinuses, and I'm all messed up. Well, I'll tell you, for one of the first times in my life, I didn't really know what to say. Because my mom was like Thumper's mom. She said, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say nothing at all. I really wanted to look at her and say, have you ever considered Arizona? <laughs> but, but I realized, you know, here's what she was not content. But you ever notice how many other folks are like that? How many folks are struggling in, 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 around us to find contentment? I want you to notice some things. Have you ever noticed your bank account never has enough money in it? And your children are never satisfied enough? Your internet is never fast enough? Your clothes are never fashionable enough? Your friends never text you enough? Your life is not as fulfilling as you would like it to be. So you find yourself asking this question over and over. What's the use? What's the point to my life? Does life even matter? In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, Solomon gives us a list of things because Solomon was looking at life as what's the point? In his life, he, he's looking at it, and with all of his wisdom, what he came to, the conclusion, was it really doesn't matter. Life has no point. That was his conclusion. He was looking at life and saying, what's the use? And I come up with five things in this first chapter, and in his view of a life, that if we have no point to our life, we're going to look at it the exact same way. Number one, life, well, without a point to our life, life seems useless. Let's look at chapter 1 starting in verse 3. It says, What profit has a man of all his labor which he takes under the sun? One generation passes away, another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. 
Now, I want you to look. I want you to think about how, how Solomon, the, this wisest man ever, he looks at his life and he sums it up this way. Worthless, worthless, worthless. It's all worthless. And he looks at it and he says, my life is useless. He seems to be looking at his life and saying, what's the use? He says, no matter how hard you work, you can never get ahead. You work your fingers to the bone, you die, your kids rent out your house, spend your inheritance, life is useless. He, he looks here and he says, you know, what problem is it man for all his work? He works and he works and he works and he works and he has nothing. So Solomon looks at life, here's this wise man, because he's found no point in his life. He says life is Useless. Life seems useless. The second thing I find here is he also says life seems unfulfilling. Look, jump down to verse 9. The, the thing that has been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Let's put it this way. Solomon's looking at life. Because he has no point to his life, he says, there's nothing new here. Year after year, it's the same old thing. And if we don't have a point to our life, that's how we're going to look at life. Well, we're going to view it the exact same way. He said, there's nothing new under the sun that says the same old thing over and over. And without a point to our life, we're going to look at it this way. We get up. We eat breakfast. We go to work. We come home. We eat dinner. We go to bed. Tomorrow, guess what we're going to do? Get up, eat breakfast, go to work, come home, eat dinner, go to bed. Guess what we're going to do the next day? Get up, eat breakfast. And, and it, seems, it seems like life is just this cycle that keeps going on and on and on. And the way Solomon viewed it, because he had no point in his life, he looked at it and said, life is so unfulfilling. You know, if we're going to look at life the way Solomon does, then Mick Jagger was right. I can't get no satisfaction. But I tried. I mean, if you think about it, you know, that's what we're doing. If we're thinking that life is just a cycle that just goes on and on, and we're going to live, we're going to die, and nothing's going to happen, then our life is unfulfilling. But we keep trying, because guess what we're going to do tomorrow? Get up, eat breakfast, go to work, come home, eat dinner, go to bed. And for us, that that. If we don't have a point, you ever notice how many restless and stressed out people there are in today's world? You ever notice how many folks are, are they're just so stressed in the circle of life? Getting up, eating breakfast, going to bed, you know, and, and, and the things that they keep doing, and then they're just so stressed about it. Don't dare mess up their routine. Because they put all this stuff as important. They have no point. Their life is unfulfilling. It's because they're trying to find happiness in the places, the people, and the things of this life. We get so stressed out. Well, we, we get so restless in our life and thinking it's so useless because we're trying to find the point, but we're trying to find it in the people and the places and the things of this life. I, I know a guy that this is what he did. He got up one morning, took his family, went to another town in another state to, to stand in line outside on the sidewalk for over an hour to get into a coffee house. After he got into the coffee house, he bought a $25 cup of coffee and said it was so good. But you know what, you know what happened? For that day, oh, it was great and wonderful, and it was just a wonderful trip. Our whole family enjoyed it. But a week or two later, maybe a month down the road, planning another trip, another adventure, another thing, because they're looking for the point of life in the people, the places, and the things. You know, when we're looking for that, and that's what satisfies us, we're going to look at life as unfulfilling. Because no trip is ever enough. No coffee is ever enough. $25. But the, the, it, it's, it, it's never going to satisfy you know, what did he do next time? Buy the $35 cup. I, mean, I don't know. 
Because when we're looking at it, it's unfulfilling. Folks, I want to tell you something this morning. Happiness can never be found in the people, places, and things of this life. If we're looking at life and we have to point in life, we're seeking happiness, life will seem unfulfilling. As Solomon looked at his life, this is the wisest man because, because he did not see a point in his life. He said life seems useless. Life seems unfulfilling. And then he said life seems insignificant. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, there's no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Here's what he says here. Nobody remembers yesterday. And the chances are really good that when tomorrow comes, nobody's going to remember it either. He looks at his life and he says, my life is insignificant because nobody remembers. Now, isn't that encouraging? That's so important that everything we do, nobody's going to remember. I started to do a test this morning. I wanted to ask, who remembered what I preached last Sunday? Or who remembered what I taught last Wednesday? Or, or, or just anything. But I was afraid that nobody would remember. So I'm not going to ask. Some of you just trying to find your notes real quick. I know. Thank you. Uh, but the, here, here's the thing. Solomon looked at life and he said, it's insignificant. You don't remember what happened yesterday. We look so forward to tomorrow, but when tomorrow comes, guess what? We're not going to remember it either. It's just going to go on and on. I know. I know. Some of you are sitting here and you're thinking, well, that's not me. I'm important. I will be remembered. You know, and if folks are going to remember me, I'm going to go down in history. But you know, the truth is, there's no point in our life. Our life is just as insignificant as his. You might think, I'll be remembered, but let me tell you what's going to happen. One day, you're going to die. Your family's going to cry. They might even go through a box or two, two tissues. The crying may last a little while. Then they're going to bury you. Then they're going to go to church and eat. Then they're going to go back to the house and split up your stuff. And let's not face it. The things that we think that we've made an importance in, the things that are significant to us, it's not going to matter to them. I once was trying to minister to a family, and in the family, Grandpa passed away. And when Grandpa passed away, you know, they, all of the family was so upset, and they, they cried. They, they, they went through a box or two of tissues, probably three or four. And, and you know, because Grandpa passed away. And then, the, the, well, they didn't even quite do it disorder. They prayed. They went to the church of the dead. Actually, some went to the house to get while the giving was good, while others went to bury him. Then they all met at the church for dinner. And, and all of a sudden, Grandpa worked hard all his life. He, he, he had significant things. I was amazed. I was amazed at one person. Out of all the things, handcrafted items Grandpa made, family heirlooms, treasures, keepsakes, one person took home Grandpa's false teeth. They were going to display them. Hang it from the ceiling with the fishing line. I don't know, but that was important. Folks, here's the thing. There's no, no point to our life. Tomorrow, we're not going to remember it. Nobody's going to remember it. Nobody's going to remember just how important you were after you're gone. And Solomon says that's how he felt about life. He was looking at it and he said, life seems useless. Life seems unfulfilling. Life seems insignificant. And without a point in our life, life's going to seem insignificant as well. But he just shows us a point. Without a point in our life, life seems uncontrollable. Look at verse 15. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. Here's, a, here's the point. Here's what he's saying. Life's like a corkscrew that can't be straightened. It's like a math problem that don't add up. Hey, he's telling us, when I look at life, I can't control it. 
You know, a lot of times in our life, when we come to a point in our life, we're going to try to control everything. We don't want everything and it's going to be controlled and I'm, I'm going to work and I'm going to fuss and I'm going to feud and I'm going to whatever so I can have all my ducks in a row and all my life will be in control. Well, here's what happens. We can't do it. Cause, and we find folks that, that they try. They try to control their life. They try to keep all their stuff in a row. You know, and, and they either get one or two things. Because we can't control life. We either get forceful or we give up. And you've probably seen it, folks, you know. Trying to control their life, trying to keep all their ducks in a row, trying to keep all their life because they have no point. So they're trying to keep all this stuff from life in one gathering and keep it in a perfect line. So what they're doing is, you know, they just, they just get mad and they get frustrated and, and it's just going to happen my way or else it's going to... They, they, they get frustrated with it. Or they just give up. I don't care anymore. It doesn't matter what's going to happen. Life is so uncontrollable. You know, we have to point our life, it is uncontrollable. There are things we can't fix. But then I find a fifth thing. I think as we look at the words of Solomon, Solomon says, life seems confusing. This is the wisest man to ever live. When he looked at his life in verse 16 and 17, I think he shows us that he thinks life seems confusing. Look at those verses. I commune with my own heart. It's kind of like he says, I ask myself, saying, Lo, I've come to this great city. I've gotten more wisdom than, than all that have ever been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had a great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is a vexation of spirit. Solomon says, I'm the wisest man ever. And I still haven't got life figured out. Uh, he, he knows he has more wisdom than anybody. And when it comes to it, he says, all this wisdom that I have is just like spitting into the wind. There's no control over it. It's unfettered. It's useless. It's insignificant. This is the wisest guy. And he says, life is so or so confusing. How does he get there? How, how did this, this writer of such wisdom get there? And you know, here's what I guess. I guess that this morning, some of you may be looking at your life and going, he's right. Look at our life going, what's the use? Maybe you're sitting here and you're going, I know exactly how he feels. How did he get there? I think I figured it out. I think I figured out what brought Solomon to this place. And I said it because I think it's how Solomon viewed his relation, the relationship between him and God. I think what brought him to this is how he viewed his relationship with he and God. Because I think there's three types of relationships. Relationship type number one are those who love God and put him first in their lives. The, those with relationship type one are type one. And this is Dan's types. This is not even scientific or anything. But my relationship type one is those who love God and put God first in their life. Those that God is the most important thing. They're going to put him uh, above everything else. I think there are those type of people. I think there's relationship type two. Relationship type two are those who say they love God, but they also have so much of themselves that they love as well. So they're, they're trying to juggle those things. And then they're trying to, to keep it all straight. Then there's relationship type three. And that's those that don't care if they have a relationship with God or not. God thinks that. I don't know why I should go to church. I'm never going to read the Bible. Old archaic thing. I can't understand it. I don't need any of that stuff. I don't need any of the singing and the praying. Relationship type three is those who they don't care about a relationship with God at all. Now when we look at these folks about David, 
King David, I think David was a relationship type one. Well, David sinned. Oh, my golly, did David sin. He did it. If it could be done wrong, he probably did it. And, and most of it's recorded in Scripture because we have all his life recorded there. But you know, when it comes down to it, you know what the Bible says about David? He was a man after God's own heart, and he loved God in all of his ways. So I think David was the type that he loved God, and he lived his life. He strived to live his life to please God. That's a relationship type one. Now Solomon, his son, Solomon said he loved God. But Solomon loved the things about Solomon as well. I mean, David, his father, told him, don't son, don't marry foreign women. Now he was just saying ladies from other nations, other countries, because they would come and they would bring their false gods and their false ways of worship into his house. And David knew the, the power and persuasion of a woman. So he, he knew that Solomon would fall to that. You know what Solomon did? He went out and married a woman from every country anywhere around so that they'd keep peace because that's their family. So he married them. Guess what happened? The women brought in all the false gods and all the false worship. Next thing you know, Solomon's worshiping this and worshiping that and doing this act of worship and doing this act of worship. He loved God, but he loved all the things in the world too. So I think Solomon was the type too. And the re reason he can get to the point that he looked at life and he said life's useless, unfulfilling, insignificant, uncontrollable, and confusing because he was trying to balance so much stuff in his life. All the good, the bad, and the ugly. And in his life, he's trying to balance that. And you know why we are like this that way? You know why we get to the point where we think life is useless and insignificant and uncontrollable and all these things? Because we're trying to balance so much stuff as well. And you know what? When we try to do that, what we're doing is we're trying to make our own point to life. And there's a lot of folks in this world who are trying to make their own point to life. You know, and then they're seeking to find that. So some they're working hard at making money. Because the point of life is to be successful. So they're working hours and they're working jobs and, and then they're, they're switching and to make more money and more money and more money. I recently met a family, or I met a couple. They decided in their life that life, the rat race was just too much. So they determined they're going to sell their big fancy house, go sell their fancy cars, cut out their memberships to the clubs. They bought themselves a pickup and a tiny house. And they're living the dream. I asked them, I said, how are you doing? So we still have a business. So how we pay the electric and gas, buy groceries, but we don't need anything else. You know, often we try to make up our own meaning to life. We want to work harder, make more. Or we try to seek that point of life through pleasure. You know, I enjoy doing this, I enjoy doing that, so I'm going to do this, I want to do that. Well, we try to, to put it into sports. I see folks trying to make their point to life and to live their life through their kids. You know, oh, my kids are going to be this, that, great, grand, and everything. So they're trying to make, the, they're trying to make their own point to life. And when we're trying to make our own point to life, life is insignificant and useless and selfish and, conclude, and confusing and all these things that we've looked at. Because we can't create our own point to life. So they're saying, well, all right, that's just too much for me. So, so their answer to their point of life is just, I want to escape from it all. That's why we find folks who sit for hours in front of the television set. You know, spend half their day on Facebook. Because they're trying, they're just escaping. You know what, here's the thing. If you haven't noticed this, I'm sorry to shock you in this way. Folks on Facebook don't think much. Just read some of the things that someone posts. You know I'm telling you the truth. But, hey, but what we, we're trying to escape. Others, they try to escape from life through the bottle. Some are trying to do it through drugs. They're trying to do it through video games. We're finding all these things. We just, we, there's no point to our lives. We're just trying to escape from it, trying to get away from it. And to us, life is confusing. We want to do but you know, if we don't know the meaning of life, 
you and I are going to be in, in despair. So maybe you're asking, how do I find meaning in my life? Especially in those things you described. Sounds an awful lot like me. Sometimes I think my life is pointless, useless. I don't know what the point of my life. How do I find it? The answer is really simple. You've got to be in the Bible. To, to find the meaning of life, you've got to be in the Word of God. You're not going to find it in social media. You're not going to find it in reality TV. The only way you're going to find the meaning of life is you're going to spend it in the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says this. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. You know what the secret is to finding meaning in life? Spend time with Jesus. Spend time in his word. That way, he's showing us the meaning of life. We're not going about life either trying to fix it or find it ourselves or escape from it. We're searching for the meaning that he has in our life. You say, Pastor Dan, I don't understand. Well, let me try to explain it by asking you this question. Are you reaching out? Or are you reaching up? Very simple. Are you reaching out? Are you reaching up? Because the folks that are reaching out, they're, 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 they're the ones that they have their hands out going more, 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 more. More money. More, more from the job. More friends. Better stuff. Bigger stuff. Did you know, I, I did a little research, I found this out. Did you know that if you make a $15,000 donation to Mountaineer Athletics, each year, you can have the opportunity to buy tickets to, per to park your RV on the front line right by the football stadium. All you, now, that's not buying the ticket. That's just to give you the opportunity to buy that. $15,000 a year in the donation. Then you buy the ticket. So that sometime when you're done tailgating, you can go inside and set in up to a $519 seat. You ever been to a Mountaineer football game? You, you realize there's folks who've actually done that? And you know what I see them doing? At halftime, they're down there with everybody else fighting over a $5 t-shirt that they're shooting in the crowd. Make $15,000 donation to buy a ticket to cost. I couldn't figure that out how much of that. So that you can sit in a five hundred dollar, five hundred nineteen dollar seat to, to, to try to get a five dollar t-shirt, folks. If we're reaching out, we're just trying to get more and more and more. And when we're reaching out, we're trying to balance and hold all these things in our hands. That's pretty much where Solomon was. Solomon was trying to balance a nation. A kingdom, his kingship, his castle, his, his wives, his concubines, his wife. He's trying to balance the people. He's trying to balance that. And somewhere in that mix, he's trying to add God as well. Folks, if our hands are reaching out, I want you to know something. God cannot pour his love in the hands that are already there. God cannot pour out his love in the hands that are already there. So what do we do? We reach up. Because that's God. We have to realize that the point of life, the point of life is bigger than us. It's not something that we can make, we can't create, we can't achieve, we, we can't. We'll never find on our own. We have to realize the point of life, the meaning of life, comes from God. He's the creator of life. He's the sustainer of life. As creator of life, Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, God created everything that there is. Read the rest of the chapter. A sustainer of life. Scripture tells us that in Christ, everything, everything is held together. You know what? There's a whole lot of folks going through life today with their hands out, trying to find the meaning of life. And they're trying it through family, 
friends, work, job, money, sex, drugs, alcohol. They're, they're trying more and more different things because there's a void there. There's a vacuum. They don't know what the meaning of life is. So they're trying. Or they're just saying, enough. I've had enough. I'm done with it. I'll just go in my own little shell and stay there. Maybe this morning, maybe this morning you're one of those folks still searching for the meaning of life. I'll tell you something. I'm agreeing with that. You'll find it in God's Word through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where you start. The meaning of life can be found through God's Word and a relationship with His Son. So dig into the Bible. And you know, there's a lot of folks today, maybe some here, that's searching for the point of their life. Well, if that's you, and inside you, you feel that, that conviction, that urging, of the Holy Spirit of God. That's that little still small voice speaking to you right now. Then it's time for you to enter into a relationship with God's Son. Admitting to Him that you're a sinner, disagreeing with Him. He knows it. Confessing your faith and belief in Jesus and trusting Jesus as your only Savior. But you know, I think there's a thing that's a greater thing. And that's those who are followers of Christ, who know Jesus, who know what the point of life is, yet we're still pouring out our life into money and things that will never last. We know Jesus. We have a relationship with him. But rather than let him guide our life, we're claiming Jesus to still try and fill it all up. Maybe this morning that's you. Maybe this morning you're the one that's trying to juggle all those things. Well, Pastor Dan, you don't understand. The kids have sports. And when they get home, they want to eat. And my husband, he's so demanding that when he leaves, he, he needs a cup of coffee before he goes to work so early in the morning. And, and Pastor Dan, I'm trying to do all these things. And I'm trying to work. And I'm trying to juggle. And I'm just going to fit God in there whenever I can. You know what? There's a lot of folks sitting in church. A lot of folks may be watching this on social media, but that's their life. And to describe their life, they use the exact same things as Solomon did. And because they've not discovered that point, or they're not letting that point guide them, they only have room in their life for just a little bit of Jesus. Maybe this morning that's you. Maybe this morning you're that Christian. But you've been trying to juggle so much. I want to ask you to do something. Not physically, but in prayer. Put your hands up. Realize that it's God that's the point to your life. It's the truth that comes from his word. It's the love and the grace of his son. Don't try to add in just a little bit of Jesus to the rest of a mixed up life. What is the point to life? Loving God and serving him with everything. Maybe this morning as we look at our lives, maybe you're struggling. I want to give you an opportunity to change that. Just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn. And as we do, I want that to be your opportunity to pray. And as you pray, just in prayer, you don't have to actually raise your hand. Put the prayer is, God, I need you. I want you to guide my life. I want to know the point, the useful. And Lord, I believe that's in Jesus. So I'm trusting you. Maybe as we sing, you, you find that life is full of so many burdens. So many things that weigh us down. You're struggling. You have time just to raise your hands. Say, God, I give it to you. 
And maybe you'll be saying, you want to do what they did in the Old Testament. They would bring their all and they'd lay it on the altar. So we look at right here, the front of this church, this is going to be our altar. Maybe as we say, you want to come and just kneel there. So, Pastor, I can't kneel, then sit there and give it to Jesus. Life's toughest question what's the point to my life? This morning, are you discovering the point of yours? Are you? Follow Jesus. If not, isn't that spirit trying to tell you to do so? Why don't you do that this morning? Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, I, I pray for each person because there's so many folks in life struggling. You know, they think life's useless and unfulfilling and uncontrollable. That they feel it's all one because they have a type two relationship. They say they love you with of stuff about themselves just so much more. So Father, I pray for every person here, every person that hears this message, that they will change. They will repent of their sin, turn from it to follow Jesus and make him not only the first, but the only in their life. In Jesus' name we pray.